Sources and Constitutional History At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Explain the history of Indian Constitution and Identify the sources of Indian Constitution Introduction to Sources and Constitutional History Hello all, welcome to the lesson. I am Alia, a proud citizen of India. I am going to start today's lesson with a story. The story of Sam Daniel, a former general of the Indian Army and his grandson, 17-year-old Jacob. So, here you go. Sam Daniel is a distinguished major general of the Indian Army who spent three decades of his entire lifetime serving the people of India. This is his wife, Sophia, and son, Gilbert. Unlike his father, Gilbert chose to be a businessman and as he wished, he started a business in Australia. He became so successful that he couldn't spend much time with his family. So, after retirement, Sam Daniel and Sophia shifted to Australia to take care of their daughter-in-law, Emily, and grandson, Jacob. Jacob grew up hearing the stories of his granddad telling about the pride of India and Indian people. Jacob also knew the secret wish of his granddad for wanting him to serve the Indian people like he did once. Meanwhile, one day, Sam Daniel received an invitation from the Indian Ministry of Defence to participate in the forthcoming Republic Day and, later on, the Beating the Retreat celebrations. Sam Daniel and Jacob were really excited about this invitation and together the family planned to spend three months vacation in India. Finally, the day arrived. The family boarded the flight to India and the next day happily attended the Republic Day celebration. Soon after the celebrations, the family started traveling to various parts of India. Jacob was awestruck by the diversity of people. The more people he met, the more he got to know about their culture, tradition and lifestyle. Eventually, he wished to be among those people and serve them. So he decided to take a course on Indian Administrative Civil Services. When Jacob told the same to his granddad, Sam became very happy and decided to give Jacob a little knowledge about the Indian Constitution before he takes up the course. So, the very next day, he took Jacob to the Parliament Museum in New Delhi, where all the details about constitutions are exhibited. And what Sam Daniel taught Jacob is what we are going to discuss in a series of lessons. Today, we are going to focus on the information shared by Sam Daniel about the history and sources of Indian Constitution. Let's start with history. Our constitution history started in 1600 when the British came to India as traders in the form of East India Company. They had the exclusive right of trading in India under a charter granted by Queen Elizabeth I. In 1765, the East India Company obtained the Diwani, the rights over revenue and civil justice of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. This started its career as a territorial power. Later, in 1858, in the wake of the Sepoy Mutiny, the British Crown assumed direct responsibility for the governance of India. Their rule continued until India was granted independence on August 15, 1947. With independence came the need for constitution. So, as suggested by M. N. Roy, a pioneer of communist movement in India, a constituent assembly was formed and, on January 26, 1950, the constitution came into being. And although the constitution was created by the people of India, various features of the Indian constitution and polity have their roots in the British rule. Now let's see what those events are in chronological order. The first four rules come under the company rule that happened in the span of 1773 to 1858. 
let me start with the Regulating Act of 1773. This act was of great constitutional importance as it was the first step taken by the British government to control and regulate the affairs of the East India Company in India. Recognized for the first time the political and administrative functions of the company and laid the foundations of central administration in India. The next act was Pitts India Act of 1784, which distinguished the commercial and political functions of the East India Company. This act was significant for two reasons. First, the company's territories in India were for the first time called the British possessions in India. And second, the British government was given the supreme control over the company's affairs and its administration in India. Their next act was Charter Act of 1833. This act was the final step towards centralization in British India. It terminated the activities of the East India Company as a commercial body and changed it purely as an administrative body. And the final act was Charter Act of 1853. It was a significant constitutional landmark since for the first time the local representation in the Indian Legislative Council was introduced because of this law and the covenanted civil service was thrown open also to the Indians. And these are the four acts under the company rule. The next set of acts is called the Crown Rule formulated in the span of 1858 and 1947. The first act among them is Government of India Act of 1858. This significant act was enacted in the wake of the revolt of the 1850s, also known as the First War of Independence or the Sepoy Mutiny. This abolished the East India Company and transferred the powers of government, territories and revenues to the British Crown. Moving on, we have our next act as Indian Councils Act of 1861, 1892 and 1909. After the Great Revolt of 1857, the British government felt the necessity of seeking the cooperation of the Indians in the administration of their country. That's exactly the reason behind this Indian Council Acts. But, among these three acts, the Indian Council Act of 1861 is considered an important landmark in the constitutional and political history of India. That's about this act. The next act was Government of India Act of 1919. On August 20, 1917, the British government declared for the first time that its objective was the gradual introduction of a responsible government in India. The Government of India Act of 1919 was thus enacted which came into force in 1921. This act is also known as montagu Kelmsford Reforms after Montagu, the Secretary of State for India and Lord Kelmsford, the Viceroy of India. And the next one is Government of India Act of 1935 This act marked a second milestone towards a completely responsible government in India. It was a lengthy and detailed document having 321 sections and 10 schedules. The final act under the Crown Rule was Indian Independence Act of 1947. On February 20, 1947, the British Prime Minister Clement Attlee declared that the British rule in India would end by June 30, 1948, after which the power would be transferred to responsible Indian hands. This announcement was followed by the agitation by the Muslim League demanding partition of the country. So, Lord Mountbatten, the Viceroy of India, put forth the partition plan known as the Mountbatten Plan. The plan was accepted by the Congress and the Muslim League. On August 15, 1947, the British rule came to an end and power was transferred to the two new independent dominions of India and Pakistan. 
Lord Mountbatten became the first Governor General of the new Dominion of India. He swore in Jawaharlal Nehru as the first Prime Minister of Independent India. Following that, the Constituent Assembly became the Parliament of the Indian Dominion. And this is what Sam Daniel told Jacob about the history of the Indian Constitution. That's a very long history, huh? I need a break. Meanwhile, you guys talk with my friend Twinkie. Hello, I am Twinkie. Guess you are tired after the long lecture. Let's talk about something else for a while. Okay, let me share with you some interesting facts about the structure of the Indian Parliament. All right, do you know how long it took to construct this massive building? Six years, and the total cost of construction was around 8.3 million Indian rupees. It covers an area of six acres, and it has 12 entrance gates in total. That's something I know about the structure of the parliament. Anyways, I have to go now. I will leave you up to Halia. See you soon. Hope you guys enjoyed talking with Twinkie. Now let's get back to the next part of Sam Daniel and Jacob's story. Let me tell you what Sam Daniel told Jacob about the sources of the Indian Constitution. Sources of Indian Constitution First, I will tell you about all the factors that contributed to the making of the Indian Constitution. There are four basic factors. French Revolution Parliamentary Democracy in Britain Bill of Rights in the US and Socialist Revolution in Russia. However, at the same time, the framers of Constitution had also considered the following factors. Historical Perspective of India Geographical Diversity of India and Cultural and Traditional Characteristics of India. And many called the Indian Constitution a copy-paste work and a glaring example of plagiarism. Most parts of it have been copied from the Government of India Act 1935. The chairman of the drafting committee, Dr. Ambedkar, gave those people a befitting reply. There is nothing to be ashamed of in borrowing. It involves no plagiarism. Nobody holds any patent rights in the fundamental ideas of a constitution. He is correct, right? Yes, there is nothing wrong in taking the good things. And the sources from which we got the various features of the Indian Constitution are tabulated on the screen. For instance, the Government of India Act of 1935 gave us the following provisions. The Federal Scheme Role of Federal Judiciary Office of the Governor Emergency Provisions Public Service Commissions and Administrative Details Next, the Constitution of the United Kingdom gave us the following provisions. Post of President Cabinet System of Ministers Parliamentary Type of Convent Post of Prime Minister Bicameral Parliament Council of Ministers Provision of Speaker in Lok Sabha Legislation, Citizenship, Writs, and Rules of Law. Similarly, we referred to the Constitution of the United States for the following provisions. Preamble, Fundamental Rights, Independent Judiciary, Judicial Review, Impeachment of President, Removal of Judges, and Functions of Vice President. Next, the Canadian Constitution gave us the following. Federal system, residuary powers in the centre, appointment of governors by the centre, and advisory jurisdiction of Supreme Court. Then, we took the following from the Australian Constitution. Principle of cooperative federalism, freedom of interstate trade, Trade and Commerce, Concurrent List, and Joint Sitting of the Two Houses of Parliament. 
Similarly, we get these provisions from the constitutions of Ireland, France, Russia, South Africa, Germany and Japan. And that's about the sources of Indian constitution Sam Daniel shared with Jacob. Now let us conclude the lesson. Conclusion Hope you got to know the basic ideas of history and sources of Indian constitution from today's lesson. All thanks to Sam Daniel and Jacob's passion for India. But hold on. Today, what I discussed with you is just the introductory part of their story. There are plenty of other things Sam Daniel taught Jacob about the Indian constitution. We will discuss them in our upcoming lessons. Until then, bye. Summary Okay guys, now let us summarize what we learned in this lesson. Indian constitution is the supreme law that determines the relationship among people living in that nation, and regulates the government and its policies towards its citizens. Our constitution came into practice on January 26, 1950. Our constitution is the result of a set of acts under the company rule, which happened in the span of 1773 to 1853, and the crown rule formulated in the span of 1858 and 1947. And, the sources from, which we got the various features of the Indian constitution, are tabulated on the screen. That's all. See you in our next lesson. Bye.